everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. Today we are in conversation with Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. My name is Ross McKeechee, and before I get into Dr. Jill's formal introduction, I'll do our usual Banyan announcements. First of all, acknowledging that although we have people joining us from all around the world, the physical location of Banyan Books in Kitsilano and Vancouver is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Banyan Books is in its 50th year, Canada's spiritual and healing resource, an independent bookstore for 50 years since 1970. So we're celebrating that and we encourage everyone to continue supporting Banyan and all independent local bookstores around the world. Of course, you can make purchases at our website, which is banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com. And of course, both of Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor's books are available there, or you can go in person. We're open every day from 11 to seven at the corner of 4th and Dunbar in Kitsilano, Vancouver. Okay, I am so excited about our guest today. Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, She is a Harvard-trained and published neuroscientist. In 1996, she experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain, causing her to lose the ability to walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of her life. Her memoir, titled My Stroke of Insight, documenting her experience with stroke and eight-year recovery, spent 63 weeks on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list and is still routinely the number one book about stroke on Amazon, a wonderful book. Dr. Jill spends most of her year aboard an 80 foot riverboat in a beautiful cove on a lake in the Southeastern United States, accompanied by her constant companions, Bella and Finley, She spends her time writing, paddle boarding, rowing, and entertaining friends and family when they come out to play. (laughs) Dr. Jill is also a dynamic teacher and public speaker who loves educating all age groups, academic levels, as well as corporations about the beauty of our human brain and its ability to recover from trauma. In 2008, she gave the first TED Talk that ever went viral on the internet. This video now has well over 26 million views. Also in 2008, Dr. Jill was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world and was the premier guest on Oprah Winfrey's Soul Series webcast. Today, Dr. Jill is here in conversation with us about her new book, Whole Brain Living, the anatomy of choice and the four characters that drive our life. In this book, Dr. Jill blends neuroanatomy with psychology to show how we can short circuit emotional reactivity and find our way to peace. It is a fantastic book, I really have to say, and I put it to immediate use and I'm looking forward to getting into this with you, Dr. Jill. Banning Books community, a warm welcome for Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, welcome to the program. Thank you, Ross. I'm excited to be with everyone up there, wherever you are. Thank you. Now, I, I think the first question I have is the journey from after you released My Stroke of Insight to the release of this book. Yes. I know you, you mentioned in, in your new book, Whole Brain Living, that after you wrote Stroke of Insight, you had made the choice. You didn't want to write another book unless you really had something to say. <laughs> so what led to this? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the only reason I wrote my Stroke of Insight was because I was spending my whole life, day, literally eight to 10 hours a day, speaking with people on the telephone who needed advice. And my mother said, you have no life. You need to write this down and turn it into a book so that you can give all this information to people who need it. And it was like, okay. So I wrote my stroke of insight and then, um, and I felt that that 
that was the gift of, uh, for me, the important part was the morning of the stroke, those three chapters that take you moment by moment by moment into the deterioration of my own brain through the eyes of a brain scientist. I thought that then anyone who experienced any of those symptoms would say, hey, I'm having a stroke, call 911 here in the state sooner rather than later. So, uh, but it, then it grew into everybody wanted to know, well, what did I do to recover? And it was like, oh, okay, so I need to write about recovery. So I added that. And then it was like, well, if I'm going to write all this, what did I learn through the eyes of a scientist for the big picture? And then it turned into the book that it, it ended up being. Um, and, and I finished that. I self-published it in 2006. And then in 2008, I was invited to give a TED Talk. And um, in those days, I didn't know what TED was. There were only five, five um, uh, talks on the internet. And it was like, okay, you know, I thought I was giving the talk to 1500 people total. And no, uh, it ended up being the first one to go completely viral on the internet. My life changed in an instant. Uh, Ted and I got famous simultaneously and it was like this whirlwind for both of us. Uh, very exciting, very interesting, but I literally had over 300,000 people write to me and say, at the end of the TED talk, I said, we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we wanna be in the world. And all these people wrote me and said, well, you had to have a stroke to find that piece. How do we find that piece? And it was like, I didn't know. I didn't have an answer for that question. So it took, uh, it took 10 years uh, for me to really figure out, well, what, how is this brain organized in a way that I can communicate with others that they have the ability to embody the left brain and what's going on there, as well as step into the consciousnesses of the right brain. And um, I was giving a, a keynote and somebody, I was talking about how great it is to talk about the brain these days because people love to talk about the brain. It's fantastic. And they have language. They know about the amygdala and the hippocampi. But the fact of the matter is we have two amygdala. And there was this audible gasp in the room. And I realized people don't realize that we have two, two halves evenly divided emotional groups of cells in each of our two hemispheres. And that changed the game for me. And how do I communicate to others that we have two emotional systems and we have two thinking modules of cells and they're four distinctively different groups of cells resulting in very predictable subsets of abilities that actually man manufacture character profiles. And that's how this book came into existence. Right, okay. So that brings us to the four characters. So there's, we have the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, which most people understand. Can you just give us the overview of the difference between those two hemispheres and then the overview of the four characters within each of those hemispheres? Absolutely. So we have, there's a myth, several myths. One myth is we only use 10% of our brain. No, we don't. Neurons are like us. They are living creatures in a, in a network and they, they require stimulation and they stimulate others. They are active and alive. So if it's a neuron and it's alive in your head, you're using it. The other myth is that the right hemisphere is our emotional brain and our left hemisphere is our rational thinking brain. And that's not true either. We have emotion in both hemispheres and we have thinking in both hemispheres, but it is true that the rational thinking tissue in the left hemisphere is in relationship to the external world. So the biggest difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, based on my experience with having the left hemisphere get a major hemorrhage, it wipes out all those cells. They then remove their inhibit inhibitory fibers on what's going on in the right hemisphere. And then I'm existing as a right hemisphere 
pretty much dominant for at least five weeks of absolute silence, and then eight years of rebuilding the circuitry in that left hemisphere. So the right hemisphere is right here, right now, easy to remember, right brain, right here, right now. It is, it is connected to the explosion of experiential information streaming in through our sensory systems. It's, it is where our breath is. Breath is the first thing we do when we're born, the last thing we do when we die, and otherwise it just runs on this track throughout our life. We can always bring our mind to our breath in order to come into the present moment, have that experience of right here, right now, versus the left brain, the left hemisphere, which actually at the level of those emotional cells the left emotional cells bring information in about the external world about the present moment and then they immediately shift into is there anything in our past experience that looks like this or sounds like this or feels like a threat so the left hemisphere immediately steps out of the present moment into our past and projects our unknown into the future so we have these emotional groups of cells, the emotion in the right brain right here, right now, and the emotion in the left hemisphere, anything that has to do with our pain from the past. And then we have, have thinking tissue on top of each of those emotional groups of cells. And those thinking cells are designed to refine and highly differentiate what's going on below. So in the left hemisphere, that is our left thinking rational about the external world where I can remember why did I put these shoes on this morning instead of another pair because I made a conscious decision to do that. My left hemisphere knows that and remembers. My right hemisphere has no clue because it's about the present moment. All it cares about is do I want to keep them on? Do I want to kick them off? Are they comfortable right here, right now? So we end up with these four groups of cells, the two emotional and the two thinking that are all very unique and different. Right. Okay. So within, within the left hemisphere, we, you're saying we have a thinking and a feeling. And within the right, we have a thinking and a feeling. Now you break those into the four characters. Can you get, I know this is just a snapshot and I really encourage everyone to get this book because it's, it's so illuminating and useful in our lives. Can you give us a brief overview of how each one of those characters works and how it feels? Absolutely. So if you take a brain, I'm going to grab my brain right here. Of course, I have a brain. Of so if course. you take a brain and the brain would be in my head like this, and you open it up to the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, you're going to have left thinking tissue, left emotional tissue, right emotional tissue, right thinking tissue. So I call these left thinking is character one. Left thinking tissue actually has a group of cells in there called the orientation association area. And that creates a holographic image of my body. So I know where I begin and where I end. And I know the position of my toes in this moment because these cells define for me the boundaries of my body. So that means I'm now an individual. My right hemisphere doesn't have that perception. So if all I have is a right hemisphere, I have no perception of myself as an individual because I don't have those cells. So instead, I am an energy being in this dense molecular organic structure and I'm big as the universe is my perception of self. And so this is not about me, the individual. This left brain is about me, the individual. It defines me. It gives me language. Part of language is I am. I am an individual. I am separate from you. I have a name. I have an address. I have likes and dislikes. So my ego center is going to be a part of that left hemisphere, both thinking and emotional. So character number one is my left thinking tissue. 
It organizes and likes to control people, places, and things. It has language, so it communicates in language, and it likes to, to organize everything. If you're, you know, it cares that the stapler goes back where the stapler belongs, and it cares that you put it back where it belongs also. So this is our A-type personality in the external world. The emotional, so that's character one. Character two is the emotion of our past. And so this is, I have to have a past recollection if I'm going to feel resentment. I resent someone for something they did in the past. I feel guilty or shame for something that I did in the past. So in order for me to experience those kinds of emotions, I, they happen inside of that left emotional character, character number two. And so this is generally our deepest wound. And this is the part of ourselves that most of us spend a whole lot of time trying to help heal our pain from the past. So character one, left thinking. Character two, left emotion. Character three is the right emotion. You can tell I'm sweating like, like a pig, which is okay, because I call my little character three pig pen. Um, <laughs> very humid on the, on the water. So, But the emotion of the present moment and the emotions of the present moment are what does it feel like? What does it feel like to have sweat on my face? What does it feel like to feel the humidity in the air or the texture of the cotton on my skin or the glasses on my nose? What does the present moment feel like? experientially. What does it feel like when I dive into the water and I feel the pressure of the water and the temperature of the water against my face? What does it feel like when, I, when I'm out in the water and I let my soul expand and I'm right here right now and there's a critter over there and I want to go explore it and I want you to come with me because I'm not just the individual ego part of myself. It's not about me. It's about the we. It's about us. Let's go play together together. Let's explore. And because it doesn't have right and wrong and good and bad judgment of that left thinking brain, it doesn't know right and wrong and good and bad. And it just, it, if it's going to color, it might want to color those leaves on that tree blue. And it might not color inside of the lines. So it's open to all possibilities. It's innovative. It's creative. It's interested and interesting. And it's communal. And it's joy. It's filled with joy. Uh, and then there's the right thinking tissue. And again, I'm open, I'm expansive. It's not about the emotion of the present moment. It's about the knowing that I am as big as the universe. I am atoms and molecules connected to everyone else's atoms and molecules. And I'm a part of a collective whole. And that whole is the human family. And the human family is in relationship to all the stars and all the movement and this beautiful planet we live in. And it's nurturing and it's supportive and it's open and it's expansive and it is a fundamental experience of love and the best way to get there is our sense of gratitude and when we feel deep deep gratitude that's when that character four comes online so we end up with these four very unique to the tissue this isn't about isn't about things i've assigned to anything this is this is what these cells do and what these cells do and each of these four different modules of cells result in these very specific skill sets resulting in very specific characters right thank you so one thing you make really clear is that all of these functions are necessary in in order for us in order for us to function as human beings. One isn't necessarily better than the other. However, you do maintain that character four, who you lovingly call, I love how you give the names to each, to each part of your brain, you call Queen Toad. This is, you maintain that this is yourself with a big ass and that the rest of your consciousnesses are just the other characters that you need to use to live this human life. And then I'm just going to read a quote here. You also say that I made a vow to myself that I would only recover. This is after the stroke as much as I had to recover for the rest of humanity to perceive me as normal. 
by definition, the price I paid to be fully human again was losing my complete connection with the infinite being associated with this character for mm -hmm. the right thinking. I made this decision to recover, however, because there was no point in me having this experience with stroke and God if I was not going to come back and share it. I want to just understand um, from your perspective, that sounds like a big sacrifice to <laughs> give, up, give up that place and come back and share that. It, has that caused you pain in the long run or how, how you know you um i feel like uh you know what i realized was that i'm going to exist in that state i believe of 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 that of the love of the universe um for eternity when i'm no longer in this body and being in this body, I am meant to be a human being. I am meant to be alive and I am meant to have a relationship with my fellow man as a human being at, with this beautiful brain as a whole brain. And when I experienced the stroke and it wiped out my characters one and my character two, it wiped out my ego, my individuality. It I had no energy. I had, I was as gone as somebody could be and still be classified as alive. And, and it was a beautiful experience of peaceful euphoria. But what good does that do me? I'm not there and I'm not here. And it was, am I willing to try? Because I could have existed in that condition probably for decades as a, in a vegetative condition somewhere um, because I, I was athletic, I'd taken good care of myself. And it was like, well, am I willing to try? Am I willing to, to try? And I felt that if I could communicate to my fellow human beings, that we are wired for peace and it is a part of our brain and it is always there and it is always turned on and it is like that blue sky regardless of what clouds may come through it as these other consciousnesses build on top of us and distract us from that perception of being at one with all that is you know, to me, that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. Was it a sacrifice? Yes, it was. But I did it with a hope in my heart that if more people understood that we can tap into our compassion, our openness, our love, our gratitude, then we can have a whole different experience on this planet than the one we're currently having. And would my suffering of what I had to give up be worth trying to help others find their way out of the suffering that they are caught in because they're hooked in that circuitry of that left brain? It was worth the, it was worth it. It was worth it. It was my journey. You know, what else was I going to do? You know, being blissful euphoria forever. It's like, <laughs> meh, you know, so, uh, <laughs> so I came back. Well, thank you. I, I think we all appreciate it. I, I certainly do. You basically point out that our our character two, our left brain feeling center, yes. is the one that is problematic. That's where our trauma and pain from the past is. This is the one that really causes the most issues in relationship. Yeah. How do we? How do we? And you you kind of point to moving. We're kind of basically moving from operating from that place towards operating more from character four. How does that process happen? And this might lead us into talking about the brain huddle too. I'm not sure. So when, when I think about little character two, first of all, both of the emotional systems are in position. So we have an amygdala and a hippocampus on this side and amygdala and a hippocampus over here. So these, this is our alarm, alarm, alert, alert system. So they are specifically designed so that in the right hemisphere, if I see a projectile flying at my head right now, I need to dodge it, right? So in the present moment. In the past though, let's say I had a trauma with a dog, a certain kind of a dog. And, um, and it scared me. And now every time I see that kind of a dog, it, that information comes in and this group of cells takes it and says, hey, I had a bad experience with that kind of a dog. I'm not safe. And it feels like a threat. 
So character two goes into alarm, alarm, alert, alert about our past experiences. So any trauma that we have experienced, it is encoded in our cells in order to protect us from that happening again so that we can recognize danger sooner rather than later. And then the alarm, alarm, alert, alert response is going to be, I'm going to fight it, going to make myself big and loud and ugly, and I'm going to fight it, or I'm going to flee and run away from it, or I'm going to go numb and I'm going to play dead. So these are natural responses, but the whole brain, Ross, is made up of cells. So every ability we have, whether it's emotions or whether it's thinking or uh, whatever it is, it's a group of cells connected in circuits. And when it comes to these emotional groups of cells, in any circuit, actually, even if it's like you're going to tap your patella, your knee patella tendon and have a little reflex action, is you're going to have from the moment you think a thought, let's say, let's say I'm terrified of this kind of a dog. And so I think, oh my gosh, there's that dog over there. And then my response is going to be fear and anger. And then I'm going to have a physiological response where something gets dumped into my bloodstream. It floods through me. It flushes out of me in less than 90 seconds. So my automatic reactivity in order to protect myself can actually run on a 90 second loop. And I say a loop because we know we can stay anxious or angry or mad or sad or happy for longer than 90 seconds, but it's because we are rethinking the thought that is re-stimulating the emotion, re-stimulating the physiological response. And then we are, are, we can witness what is going on. We don't have to act out on it, but we have these natural, I call this the 90 second reset. So when I am triggered emotionally, when my little two does see something or it becomes reactive or it's like, uh, you know, um, any little irritant in our environment that, you know, it can be a bee, a little sweat bee and I'm sweating. And so it really likes me. And it's like, mm, eh, eh, irritation, irritation, you know, that's going to run for me for a 90 second spot if I'm truly triggered uh, by, by that. Um, so we do have this ability to observe what is going on inside of ourselves instead of simply engaging with it and, and running things on automatic. We actually have other parts of our brain that we can then have a relationship with that little character too in order to essentially save ourselves from ourselves. Okay. So this brings me to asking you about the brain huddle, which is the primary tool that you recommend in this book. And, and I found it really quite easy to understand and put into practice right away. And even this morning, as I was preparing for the interview, I started checking in with each of the four characters. Can you give us just an overview of how the brain huddle works? Absolutely. So um, I call it brain as an acronym. Of course I do. Brain huddle. And so I think of these four characters inside of our brain as our brain's team. And what do teams do? They get together and they have huddles where they're actually all in there and they're all communicating. And they're communicating in the present moment about what comes next. So B stands for breath. It doesn't matter. Let's say I'm sitting here chatting with you and it's like, okay, Ross, let's have a, let's to each take a brain huddle. So my character one, it's my rational mind. It's the one showing up right now. Um, and she's going to call the huddle. Well, I could be really unhappy and upset and decide, okay, team, I need a huddle. And, or I can be in my playful spirit and just be so filled with joy. It's like, let's have a huddle. Let's have a huddle. Or my character four can say, okay, team, let's come together. I'm feeling such deep emotional gratitude or such gratitude for life. And all of us, let's call the huddle. So B is stands for breath. Breath is that train that's going in the present moment. As soon as I start to focus on my breath, it brings me my consciousness to the present moment. I'm thinking about my breath. Is it deep? Is it, is it not deep? What's happening to the rest of my, my body? Am I feeling relaxed? Breath, bearing my mind to my breath. So B, focus on the breath. R 
stands for recognize which of those four characters was I in who called the huddle in the first place. R, recognize. BRA is appreciate the fact that regardless of what I was doing before the I, we called the huddle, all four of us are here. All four of us are present. Okay, I'm in the present moment. A, appreciate, I, inquire, okay, under these circumstances, what do I want to do next? Which of us, which of the four characters do we want to give the microphone to? And then N stands for navigate. And then we go back into action and we navigate the next moment and then the next moment and then the next moment because life is this, this collection of moments. And so, so a quick little example is let's say I walk into a room, I, all four of me walk into a room and there's a couple in there and they've been fighting. And we know we can, you can pick up on those cues. We got these beautiful right hemispheres that pick that up. So I'm now in an awkward position because I just walked in on an argument there in their embarrassment. I'm in my, where am I, what am I in? Brain huddle, brain huddle, what are we going to do? So character one comes on and she says, okay, well, I can suggest, I can offer any, any, any help, any assistance. Do they need anything? Uh, do they need a phone call? Do they need uh, water? You know, can I help them? Uh, character two is going, I don't want to be in here. I don't want to be in here. <laughs> or either that or, or I'm uncomfortable. This is awkward. I feel embarrassed. Uh, character three is going, well, you know, my, it might be a good time for a little humor. I could say something silly and maybe that might be the right thing to do. Um, and character four is saying, um, you know, uh, we have you. Uh, we support you if you need us, me, anybody, anything, we're supporting you, we're right outside. So all four, I always have four choices. We have four choices in every situation we enter into. And the power of the huddle is actually having that become a conscious decision and a conscious choice where all four characters get to weigh in on the, on the decision-making process. What's, what's actually happening in the brain on a physiological level when that process is going on? Well, physiologically, you're bringing your, man, your brain into the present moment and you're bringing your focus and your awareness of these different parts of yourself. You know, we, we think about, we think about uh, like the, the four Jungian archetypes. These actually lay exactly on those four primary archetypes, except in that language, Character one is the conscious one, and the other three are in the subconscious or in the unconscious. And it's like, no, they don't have to be that way. They have very specific personalities. We can get to know them. We don't have to be functioning from a conscious, unconscious perspective. We can bring all four of them into our consciousness as though they're different layers and we have these different choices. So, so everybody's just awake. I mean, we are, this is really waking ourselves up to our own power. Now, uh, I, I just want to let everyone who's here live know that we're going to be taking questions from you. I see there's quite a few in there already, but anybody who's not aware, you can type your questions into the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen for Dr. Jill, and we'll get to those in uh, probably not more than 10 minutes. How long does it take to make something like the brain huddle um, habitual for us so that we are, we automatically go to that? How, how much training does it take? You know, I think it's different for different people. I mean, you're already absorbing the material. You're already saying, okay, let me try the huddle. You're saying you can, you've already noticed that you have more awareness. So you've started the process. And again, you have to remember that, that everything in the brain, every ability we have, every thought we think, every emotion we have, every physiological response is cells inside of our brain performing those functions. So we have the ability to create 
that circuitry, we know about neuroplasticity. I absolutely would not be, be sitting here speaking to you if my brain was not able to have those cells rearrange which cells they're communicating with in order to, to recover from some kind of a, of a trauma like a severe stroke. So learning is neuroplasticity. From moment to moment to moment, our brain is constantly shifting and changing. So I think it's going to depend on how much do you practice it? How much do you use it? You know, the beautiful thing about neurons and circuits is the more often you run a circuit, the stronger that circuit becomes. And then eventually that circuit begins to run on automatic. I personally, I will literally 20 to 30 times a day say, hot all but I can do it like this. They all come online. I say hello to everyone. I check in with everyone. I wonder, I ask myself, I always ask Helen, that's what I call my character one. Am I supposed to be somewhere right now or am I okay to play for a while? <laughs> you know, because if I'm out paddle boarding and I'm chasing the turtles and having fun, then it's like time just goes by. So, so, you know, I take my phone with me all wrapped up in a plastic bag and I put a timer on. I mean, I have to do that in order to keep Helen happy because otherwise Helen is always on and she's always nagging me. And it's like, we need to look at the clock. We don't know if we're safe. We don't know if we're okay. We've got obligations. We got to do this. And one of the beauties of having a huddle is it's like, okay, right now I've got uh, two hours before I've got to be on a podcast. So I've got time. Pigpen, who I call my little character three, who's always making a mess. I got time for her to go for a nice paddle board. We can kind of like just go and play. We can jump in the lake. We can have some fun, plenty of time to get cleaned up and come in so that Helen can do what Helen needs to do. But when I do that, when I hold the huddle, I feel no guilt. I feel no remorse. I feel I don't question myself anymore because the huddle has made the decision so Helen knows hey I'm going to play for an hour Helen and then you're going to be back on you're going to get your time we're going to do what we need to do are you okay with that schedule and she's calculating the timing and is it all going to work out and it's like yeah that makes sense to me and we'll even have time to fit in some lunch and and you know so so it's it's a democracy inside of the head and it's a matter of everybody gets a vote everybody gets a voice and everybody agrees so that when I am being a pig pen Helen's not not being critical. And when Helen's working, Pigpen isn't saying, come on, I want to go play. Come on, I want to go play. Come on, there's only two hours left to sunshine. Come on, come on, come on. So that I feel peace. Nothing worse than feeling anxiety all the time because you, you the different parts of you are in conflict. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There, 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 to me, there are endless applications for this in all the different ways that we function in life you focused in on some really important ones. Um, I, I wanna ask you first about in our romantic relationships, how these characters interplay and even point to how they might match up in relationship if we have one dominant over the other. So can you give us a, a, a overview of how that looks? Sure, so you, remembering that I'm four characters and you're four characters. That means in every intimate relationship, every in every relationship, there are eight of us. And so we get along with people who, when we have a good special matchup of these characters. So uh, let's say I'm not very happy. And so I'm going to, I know who to call to bemoan because I know who's, who likes to bemoan with me. I also know who to go for soothing if I need to call a friend in order to go soothing. Um, character ones who are rational and organized, they tend to like other people who are structured and organized. It becomes a predictable relationship. Um, character ones, and, and character twos, character twos, because we're in our pain, if our, this is our dominant character profile, then if I'm in my pain, I need someone to take care of me, or I need somebody to complain with because misery loves miserable company. So think about your primary relationships with your partners. Think about your children. 
you know, we know if our children child is a primary character three, the place is a disaster. They're always laughing or they're they're squealing like little pigs. They're into everything. Uh, I can't keep them on a schedule. They're going a million miles an hour. Or we know if we have a character one child who really is academic, likes to learn, likes to collect like things and put them all in order. And the room is nice and neat. And I know many people are going, boy, I didn't get that child but there is that child out there you know and we know if we have an unhappy little child and we also know if we've got child you know anytime you look at a child and you say oh my gosh that's an old soul then that's because you're feeling their love and there's a peacefulness about them and an openness about them and a knowingness that we just can't understand so in romantic relationships yeah, the three is the adrenaline junkie. And, you know, adrenaline junkies tend to like adrenaline junkies because they want to go do adrenaline junkie stuff. And uh, character ones can get exhausted by a strong character three. However, when you know who your characters are and you respect all four in each of us. So I have a, a, a friend, some friends who are a couple and she is a school teacher and she's very character one and organized and structured. She controls the room. She controls the kids. She controls teaching through the pandemic. She controls, she's, she's excellent at character one but she has a strong character three and she loves to play tennis with her character three. Well, her husband is a primary character three and he was working from home and he loves to play tennis and but he's got a strong one as well so he works at home but he's more of a three so my friend she can now call him, her husband up and say honey i'm coming home and i'll tell you what i need you to be a character one for 30 minutes and if you give me 30 minutes of you being a character one we can be character threes the rest of the evening and so now he's over here going, oh my gosh, I know what she needs. And yeah, if I, if all it's going to cost me is 30 minutes of being a character one, I can do that. And then we get to go and play the rest of the evening together. It, this language opens up a, a level of communication that may go straight to the point get straight to the heart of the matter. Otherwise, what would happen? She would come home. He'd say, okay, let's go play tennis. You said we could go play tennis. And she says, well, I can't go play tennis yet. I need to do some work. I need you to help me. And he's going, well, I don't want to help you. I want to go play tennis. You said we could go play tennis. So now his three goes into his character two and she's going, no, I can't go play tennis. I need your help. Why is it you are inconsiderate? You can't give me 30 minutes of helping me. So she moves into her two and now we've got this tit for tat two for two which will never have a resolution and it could have been so much easier yes <laughs> yes i yeah uh, a big yes i think we've all been there <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> haven't we now we've got a lot of audience questions here so i'd like to dive into those if we can um yeah and, and the first one i think is is a really good one this is from kat and she says, how do you work with making important decisions when character number two has been triggered and taken control? Well, and isn't that the, the biggest question? You have to get out of the emotional reactivity and before you make that decision. Um, it's hard to do because uh, she, this part of our, our brain is, is reactive. It wants to fire back. Uh, it wants to write those emails that never should have been written in the first place. It wants to, to you know, uh, burst out in hostility. Um, so this is when you take your 90 seconds, you know, you essentially um, uh, take a break, you go, first of all, I'd like to emphasize my character too is my responsibility. Soothing my character too is no one else's responsibility. It's not my partner's responsibility. It's not my parents' responsibility. It's not a stranger's responsibility. It's my responsibility. And in the brain huddle, I can actually train the relationship between these four characters. So if I move into my character too, and I'm unhappy, and I feel that trigger, and I feel like I want to lash uh, immediately, and yet I have a decision and I'm feeling anxiety because I'm being pushed. Push. Character one will come in and, and she's the fix it machine. So character one will come in and say, 
are we physically safe? Are we okay? Is there anything we need to do in order to make ourselves safer? Well, I might need to walk out the door. Being in the presence of someone who triggers me, sometimes the best answer is to get away from that person. I have legs, use my legs and walk out. And then character four can come online and say, honey, I got you. All four of us are here. Your back field is here. All the energy in our brain right now is in you. We feel the anxiety. We feel the anger. We feel the pain. It's okay. Let's give it 90 seconds. But the rest of us are present here with you. Let's breathe. Let's take ourselves and be with ourselves and bring our minds into the present moment. Because whatever that fear or that pain or that threat was, if it's not right here, right now, we have the ability to bring our brain to the present moment to recognize that that threat is no longer real. And this is part of what we can do with helping ourselves when we have a flashback for PTSD. And then once we, we, and we can train ourselves to use our own character for our all loving that says, I'm just grateful I'm alive. And boy, isn't life filled with crazy. And I got my crazy and we all got crazy and wow, but I'm alive and we're all capable of being crazy. So let's honor that and respect that but let's not make a decision out of that character two profile. Thank you. We, we have a question from another Jill. And I think <laughs> this is a good one to clarify because you do make this quite clear in the book. So why does it seem to you, Dr. Jill, that one has to give up the connection to the love of the universe, quote unquote, to be a functioning human being? It seems like spiritual teachings suggest that we can experience this as a form of quote unquote enlightenment and still exist as a functioning human. That is the ultimate goal of this book, whole brain living, because they're all there. They're all available at any moment in time. And if I, as I was clearly just a character four, I was an absolutely non-functional human being. I had to have my left brain in order to be able to have language, in order to have my identity as individual. But you're absolutely right. You don't have to sacrifice it. They're all there. So when we were talking earlier about the sacrifice, it was about just living as that existence with none of the other uh, stuff going on inside of my head. So in order to be a completely functional and whole brain human being, it requires that I use all of me. So now I don't feel it as a sacrifice. I live on a boat six months out of the year. I have created a world that allows me to support the part of my character that I want to exist in and be. And then I can bring the rest of my other characters online in order to be a functional human being. And ultimately, when you think about what is the evolution of the human being, it's going to be working the kinks out between the, the, the emotion and the thinking tissue in each hemisphere, the thinking with the thinking tissue, and then the emotion and the emotion tissue. So ultimately, it's just like this, and you can be any of it and all of it all at the same time. But somebody wants the microphone. Yes, they do. Now, we, <laughs> we have a question from Jennifer um, referring to when you mentioned Jung's four archetypes corresponding to the four characters. She asked, which archetypes correspond to which characters? Okay. Uh, the shadow is character number two. The, um, the self is the character one. The anima animus, which is character three, which makes sense because anima animus is male and female. And that's without the consciousness of my relationship with me, the individual. And then um, what do they call the, the last one? I haven't read my book lately. Do you remember? So it, would that be character four? Yeah, character four. The this, this self. Okay, then what's character one? Um, the ego. The ego, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the big S self is going to be um, uh, character four because it, it is. And I do believe that at the end of the day, when we have lived our lives and the character one and all of its concerns in the external world quiet down, and we all know our world gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we, we get older and older and we, we reach the point where we're on our deathbeds. And hopefully the character two emotional pain and fear that too will be brought, will be uh, softened by our character for love. Uh, we simply don't have the energy to have an experience now other than the experience of dying. And um, I, I'm personally one of those people, I, I want to have that experience. I, I want to have, I want to be aware, I want to feel, I want to I want to be a part of that transition. Um, and then the character four, I believe, is where that's the consciousness that exists in every cell of our body. And it was the energy of the universe that fueled that original zygote cell that ultimately multiplied itself and multiplied itself into 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses to have all this differentiation and refinement. So I think we're, I think it, we, we go home. I think we go back home to that consciousness of that character for, but we don't have to be dead to know it. And we don't have to, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be unconscious. Thank you. Uh, towards on the on the note of aging, there's a question from Valentina. She says, "Is it true that our thought patterns cannot change after a certain age?" Absolutely not. They're constantly changing. Your thought patterns that you came in with, if we did a brain scan and looked at literally billions and billions of bits of data inside of your brain, we're creating something like 1.8 a uh, billion new synaptic connections every second, every second. So no, we're learning. The ability to learn is the brain changing its what it knows. And it changes what it knows by rearranging who it's communicating with. So no, we are, we are that's, that's the ability of the brain to recover. And and it's a real thing and it happens, it, and, and it likes novel stimulation. So as we age, it's so important that we, we give it new and interesting data to work with because we want it to keep growing. And, and if we, as we age, we just start routinizing and minimizing our actions, then we're essentially saying to our brain, you know, I don't need you to be able to do all of these things again. I, I'm going to routinize and all I need you to do is my routine. And then I get smaller and smaller and smaller in ability because I'm getting smaller and smaller in the connections of the circuitry inside of my brain. So if you want a vibrant brain, keep teaching it, keep learning it. Try, try new things, jump on a paddleboard and see what does that really mean to every muscle in your body or uh, learn a new language or learn a new musical instrument or travel. Travel requires that we're in the present moment and that we're constantly bringing in new stimulation in order to get just to get where we need to go. So the brain is constantly changing and, and uh, it loves novel stimulation. Thank you. There's a question from Ian and he's talking about the brain huddle. Ian asks, how do we know we are truly engaging or huddling with the other brains, parts of our brain, as opposed to a creation or figment of our left thinking brain? Well, I think that that's a really good question. You know, the last time you had a belly laugh, my guess is that you really had a belly laugh. And that part of you that is capable of having a belly laugh, if it's truly a belly laugh, is in the present moment. We have the ability to consciously choose to get into that character. So um, I, this is where I think it's um, important to read the book because the book's going to give you a chapter on each of these four characters. At the end of those chapters, these descriptors, it's going to ask you very specific questions about each of your characters. So for example, at the end of, character, of chapter one, 
I encourage you to pay attention. First of all, do you even recognize this part of yourself? Well, if you're talking about your character four, you might say, no, I don't even know this part of myself. And so then it's going to, it's going to set you up for success in order to specifically identify when this character might be coming out. And then you can try to train yourself to recognizing when are you already there? And if you ever sit back and you experience an awe-inspired sense of gratitude that you're alive and you just look at a sunset and you melt into that sunset because it is so beautiful, trust that that's your character four and that that's what that feels like inside of your body. We know when we're not very happy. We know that part of ourselves. We know when we're chipper and fun and curious and interested. And if we don't, Go through the questions and try to identify that part of yourself. And if you cannot identify that part of yourself, then ask people who know you if they can identify that part of you. And if they cannot identify that part of you, then let's figure out how you might train yourself to do things and allow yourself to be like that more often and ask yourself, if I'm not allowing myself to being creative and open and innovative and adventurous, is it because my character one is constantly ridiculing that part of me so that part of me doesn't feel safe? So in the book, it actually will take you through the process of exploration so that you can find those parts of yourself. That's a really useful part of the book. I found that at the end of each section where you get to go through the work questions and identify it. So I encourage everyone to get the book, banyan.com. Um, Rob asks, I had a brain injury on the front, on the right front and was in a coma. It now seems like I have one character running the show and limited access to the other characters. What can I do to increase the collaboration? Um, uh, for that, first of all, um, I'm going to go right back to neuroplasticity and the ability of the brain to recover. The trauma that you experienced was probably a trauma that happened at a time period. And during the experience of the trauma, everything was in trauma and questionable for, for wellness. However, if that is behind you now, then now you know what stabilization is. You have stabilized. And in that stabilization, you can observe yourself differently. And at this point, you can start rebuilding that brain. And you can start building not only the connections between the cells, but our brain experiences neurogenesis. We can actually create new neurons in order to replace cells that have been damaged. So what I would encourage you to do is to get the book, read the book, make lists if you have the ability to do those things and focus on what parts of me do I know really well? What parts of me am I not exhibiting? And what is that list? So say, for example, it's your right frontal lobe. And in the right frontal lobe, you might not be real good at monkey see, monkey do with other people because we've got these mirror neurons up there. And um, being able to watch somebody and then duplicate that. Now you might be good at that. You might not be good at that, but that's just one example. You might have a problem de detecting the intonation, the emotional content of a voice when someone speaks to you. You might just think people are always angry or people are always this, that, or the other. Well, they're not. There's variety. We can actually, once you know what is missing, then you can then work on retraining yourself to regain that specific ability. Now, if that the trauma, those cells can be repaired enough in order to recover function, maybe not, but you have a comparable set of cells in the opposite hemisphere where the trauma was not, and, you, and they are also specifically designed 
morphologically, structurally, they look the same, they have the same abilities, you might be able to retrain that left brain then to regain those abilities. So you have to think about the brain as this magnificent collection of cells and circuits, circuits resulting in different kinds of thoughts, different kinds of emotions, different kinds of experiences, ultimately resulting in different kinds of behavior. What do I have? What can I identify as I have? Check those off. And whatever you think is missing, explore. What's it gonna take for me to be able to identify that? I have to start with the, at the beginning. But never give up on your brain. Thank you for that. This is our going to be our last question from the audience. Um, we're getting close to our time. This is from Robin. Robin asks, in your astonishing TED talk, you described the two hemispheres of the brain and that your stroke effectively shut one side down. What you described next has stayed with me ever since. And I wanted to ask if you think you might have experienced reality as it actually may be, as quantized bits of matter or energy, as per our current understanding of quantum physics. Absolutely, 100%. You know, um, the, the, this whole concept of, you know, I have to have the, that group of cells in that left hemisphere to identify me as the individual and as a solid separate from whatever else is beyond me. And in the absence of those cells, then everything is atoms and molecules in flow. And I just go right back into the, the, the energetic flow where my energy is big enough to connect with your energy wherever you are. And through consciousness, there's no boundaries there. So yeah, I think that quantum uh, mechanics and quantum physics are actually beginning to open our left brain minds to looking at science as, okay, we do have these very different ways of perceiving. We already know that, you know, when we study different kinds of birds, that one part of the brain is looking at the whole prairie and another part of the brain is focusing in on that little delicious critter that it wants to snatch up. So what part of our brain is open and expansive and another group of cells allowing us to find focus. So I think we're, we're getting there. You know, I think that there's so much research now that's really absolutely amazing. When I lost that left hemisphere and it stopped inhibiting that right hemisphere, I became what is, is that reality? Well, that is the reality of the right hemisphere. The reality to my left hemisphere is that this external world is made up of solids and individuals and that's the world I get to live in. So to me, the beauty of whole brain living is knowing all of it and having the opportunity to be able to say, you know, life, whatever that was, whatever that conversation was, whatever that's about, uh -uh, I'm not going to let that clutter me right now. I'm going to go be in my bliss and just be grateful I'm alive. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You make it really clear. The last section of the book is perfect, whole, and beautiful. Any, any parting words for us on the implications of this outlook and the possibilities of whole brain living for uh, a better world? We have so much more power over what's going on inside of our heads than we have ever been taught. And I do believe that sanity will come to the planet one brain at a time. And to me, whole brain living is a tool that we can use in order to find our most peaceful selves. And I do believe the more of that we push out into the world as individuals, the more peaceful our planet will be. Thank you so much. A beautiful message. And your work is so useful and helpful and uplifting. And Thank you. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the Banyan community and beyond really appreciates it. Uh, I just want to give a big thanks to our producer, Jacob Steele, who coordinates all of the Banyan events and the Banyan podcast and does a fantastic job. Uh, thanks to everybody at the shop at Banyan Books and to Colin, the owner of Banyan Books, who's been keeping it alive for 50 years. Um, and of course, uh, our Banyan community, thanks to everyone who supports us and um, keeps us going as, together. Uh, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, much gratitude. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, everyone.